the quantitative aptitude section lots and tips and tricks that uh, we can talk about for this section uh, i can make uh, future videos uh, going into more detail but in this video i just want to give you an overview of the important uh, tips and tricks for this section so that uh, it will be helpful for all the upcoming examinations so let's start hi this is supriyo so the five tips uh, that we are going to talk about today for the quant section now uh, remember that quant section is uh, definitely one of the most important sections uh, but don't take any kind of stress if you are not good in this section because you don't have to be excellent you just have to pass it and uh, even in some examinations you can go through without uh, uh, having a lot of hold on the quant subjects now uh, i have seen a lot of misconceptions about the quantitative aptitude section and one of the important ones is that uh, people they do not differentiate between their prelims and their mains strategies now for both of these phases you have to actually change your strategy a little bit because you cannot have the same strategy personally i used to tweak it uh, according to the mocks whatever kinds of mocks i used to give i used to always find out what are the types of questions that i should attack first and what are the questions that i should go for in the second pass or the third pass like that so you have to of course do it from the way that you analyze your own mocks because everybody's strength and weaknesses are different uh, but i will tell you what i used to do so for the prelim section what i used to do is that i would always go for the approximation first the approximation and the simplification those types of questions because i found those to be quite easy then i used to go for the quadratic equations the quadratic equations were definitely also quite doable most of the times maybe one question might be hard but most of the questions are quite easy and then i used to go for the number series and the number series of course the missing number series the wrong number series and all all kinds of different types of number series you have to practice so that in the examination these easy marks you do not miss now these are the uh, trifecta that you have to go and uh, do it in the first early stages of every, every uh, prelims examination but after you complete these types of questions what you are going to do uh, so i actually uh, calibrated my strategy depending on the paper so in some papers you would see that there are very easy arithmetic questions so if there are some very easy arithmetic questions then go for it uh, they are very scoring and uh, they are just something that you can easily do i don't think a lot of time is wasted if you uh, apply the proper strategies if you apply the proper concepts and otherwise sometimes i would also go for the dis so for the uh, questions uh, like in the dis you would find very simple questions sometimes sometimes they are just uh, a little bit more calculative that is all and uh, sometimes even the calculations can be simplified you can approximate a few values and you can get to the answer so those types of dis i found to be very very easy so that is how i used to tackle the prelim section and i used to ensure that whatever the easy questions were i solved them at the beginning itself so you always have to do it like that that you have to uh, solve all your easy questions first you cannot just uh, spend your time on the hard questions and then at the end uh, if you are left with some easy questions it is very very poor in that kind of a situation so for the mains what what i used to follow so for the main strategy the first thing that i used to go for was the di now this is something that many people say it's not a good strategy but for me personally it worked very very well i think the reason that it worked quite well for me is because i had practiced a lot of data interpretation questions so that was definitely it and what i used to do uh, for example there are some hacks you can use so for example even in the hard dis uh, maybe there are some missing dis or uh, some kind of dis where the table is not uh, that well uh, done so it's not actually there so it's just a graph and lots of values so what i used to do for the hard uh, dis i used to actually uh, just uh, uh, redraw the table so i used to redraw my own table okay so what i used to do was i used to just uh, take the values from the question and i used to create my own table and this actually helped me to solve very complex questions as well so i would definitely tell you to do that if you can and of course in your practice sessions you will understand what kind of questions i am talking about so those questions where you have some missing values or those questions where the values are uh, in the form of a line graph or something like that that so in those questions you have to refer back to the drawing again and again so instead of that you just uh, plot the values you just write down the values and then you start to calculate so that actually helped uh, quite a lot because initially it would take you maybe 2 or 3 minutes to actually go ahead and 
draw that entire thing on your rough sheet but once you did that then the entire question it became very very simple so that is something that really helped me so first things always the di's two or three di's whatever i could solve i would always go for them and after the data interpretation was done then i used to go for some arithmetic questions as well so for the arithmetic questions what happens is you have to actually pick and choose because uh, there are some easy ones like the ones for the averages then you have the percentages then you have the ratios so those types of arithmetic questions are quite easy so you can go and attack them at the beginning of the paper after the di section is done and otherwise if you see that the arithmetic is too difficult then you can go for the number series or the quadratic equations and uh, you can also go for the like the simplification is of course not there but there are some quantity one quantity two types of questions like some kind of data sufficiency questions so those questions also you can go uh, if you do not actually find any easy arithmetic over there so you have to calibrate your approach as i told you and this is how i actually used to do it and uh, let me also tell you uh, what kind of uh, arithmetic questions i used to tackle uh, in the early stages of the paper because uh, for me personally i found that uh, for some arithmetic questions i was actually uh, quite good at some of the arithmetic questions but at other types of arithmetic questions i was not that good so some of the easy ones uh, were i think uh, distance and time so distance and time questions they were mostly very easy types of questions so you have some boats and streams types of problems then you have train problems and anything related to like speed distance and time so uh, those questions i found to be quite easy and i used to always attempt them then we have the profit and loss so profit and loss questions sometimes they can be convoluted and maybe a little bit more complicated but most of the times at least 80 to 90 percent of the times these questions are quite straightforward and you can go ahead and you can easily solve these questions and after that there are some partnership questions as well so partnership was definitely an area where uh, i excelled and it was really very very simple and even the partnerships the ages problems so anything kind of uh, dealing with the ratios so ratio chapter please make sure that you are very very well conversant with the ratio chapter because it can bring you so many marks i'm telling you ratio is uh, something that if you know the concepts you can go ahead and you can easily solve these questions and uh, that is why it is something that you should always be looking at and uh, then also so i used to do the permutation or the combination and also the probability questions because i saw that mostly if you see the uh, question pattern then they were not actually changing the pattern for these types of questions almost every time the same kind of pattern was coming so that actually made things quite easy and then also the time and work now about time and work i would like to say that some questions can be very very tricky in the time and work and especially the questions like uh, the cistern questions the cistern questions and also the pipes and streams questions so uh, those types of questions uh, sometimes they can actually convolute the uh, entire question in such a way that you are not able to wicker it out so uh, approach it with caution only if you are good then uh, you go for them otherwise you just leave it and finally the mensuration question so the mensuration questions were also something that uh, were actually quite easy because you just have to know the formula and if you know the formula then the entire question becomes very very easy so this uh, was the kind of thing that i had in my mind and of course you cannot always follow this because you might not be good in these types of questions but i am telling you the approach so usually uh, you have to figure it out after giving lots of mocks which are your strength areas so you can actually attempt those questions and leave out the rest so always try to calibrate things uh, based upon your own strengths because that is something uh, that is quite invaluable and uh, also about the order of the difficulty so i told you uh, you have to calibrate it according to your mock test and i told you the order uh, that i used to attempt these questions in but uh, you have to actually go ahead and uh, just find out the order that works best for you so that is how you have to basically do it and uh, then you have to have some innovative solutions or out of the box solutions for some problems and if you can do that then it really becomes uh, very easy some questions they are very easily solved so for example you can do some elimination kind of things so you can eliminate uh, many many types of options and then you can also do plugging in the options so you can what uh, you can do is you can create the equation or whatever it is and then whatever the options are there you can plug it one by one and you can just see whether the equation is holding and then you don't need to solve the equation you can just plug in the values and you can find the answers and so elimination plugging in these types of things actually make things very very simple now about innovative solutions we can have another uh, entire video where i can take you through some various different types of these types of solutions but here what i'll do
do i can just show you uh, something that uh, i was actually looking at the other day uh, so somebody asked me about the unit digits so the unit digit problems are i think very very fascinating so for example take this question question number 1 is find the unit digit of 287 to the power of 562581 so uh, on the outset like uh, you cannot solve this question normally that is not possible to normally solve this question in an examination environment so what you can do is you have to think about the power cycles and about cyclicity so maybe some of you have already uh, read about cyclicity so for example 7 whenever you are uh, actually squaring 7 so what happens when the first like when it is 7 to the power of 1 then it always ends in 7 right so when you go for the squaring what happens then you go for 9 right because 7 7 is a 49 so the unit digit it actually comes as 9 so this is how the unit digit actually progresses uh, when you go to the third power then it actually goes to 3 because 7 9 is a 63 so that is how the 3 comes and then if you are going to the fourth power what happens then you are again multiplying by 7 so this actually becomes 21 so 1 the unit digit comes as 1 so you can see now if you multiply this by 7 again what happens then it again returns to 7. So in this kind of a situation we say that the cyclicity of 7 it is actually 4. So there are actually 4 different unit digit values whenever you are actually multiplying by 7. So it actually uh, is always in this pattern 7, 9, 3, 1. So now we know that uh, there are actually four possibilities over here. So this question becomes very, very easy. What we have to do, we basically have to take this power and we have to divide it by four. And then we have to find out where exactly we actually have to uh, stop so that we find the unit digit. So if we have like five, six, two, five, eight, one. So if you divide it by four, what actually happens? So one, uh, four, uh, zero, six, uh, then you have uh, four, then you have five and uh, yeah so the remainder uh, it actually comes to one right okay so when you divide this number by four uh, the remainder it actually comes as one so because the remainder comes as one so what happens what does this mean this means that if you uh, just arrange these things in blocks of four then you are stopping in this position because it is position number one so this means that the unit digit of this entire thing it is going to be seven and d is your answer so this is how you can actually simplify things whenever any kind of complicated questions like these are given to you. Now uh, let us see the second question. So uh, it is also something that you can do in a very similar kind of a way. So uh, this question, the second one, it is actually uh, firstly given to you as a simplification, right? So you have to simplify and x, this is the x, the value that you have to find out. So you can do the uh, approximation and you can find out the uh, answer to this question. But instead of approximation, then is another simple thing that you can do think about the unit digits again the unit digit so for this number the unit digit it is going to be 4 right because it is 2 to the power 2 then 8 to the power 2 what is the unit digit again the unit digit is 4 and here it is just 3 so this uh, the entire right hand side what you are actually doing when you are talking about the unit digit only 4 minus 4 minus 3 so 4 minus 4 it is actually coming to 0 so 0 comes then 0 minus 3 what is the answer for this you cannot say minus 3 of course because you have to actually borrow borrow from the uh, left side so this actually becomes 10 minus 3 so this actually turns out to be 7 so in the right hand side the unit digit will be 7 now on the left hand side it is actually what 9 square so 9 square this is actually going to be 1 so whatever this number is you can actually square it and the digit what it will be it will be something plus 1 equal to 7 so this has to be 6 now you have to just find out which one of these numbers whenever uh, you are squaring it is actually coming out to be 6 so 86 if we square it is it 6? Yes, it is 6. So this can be our answer. Uh, and all the others you can actually eliminate. See, because 9 square, it cannot be 6. Uh, 3 square cannot be 6. And 3 square cannot be 6. So your answer is 86, option number A. So you see how you can easily find out the 
answer to these questions without even solving the problem. So these are the kinds of innovative solutions that I'm talking about. And of course, we can go into it in some other video in depth so that you can have many more examples and you can understand these innovative solutions. But always you have to try and find out the simplest solutions for any kind of complex problems and just think about it. How can I conceptually solve any problem? And uh, it will be very, very useful for you. And uh, then many people were asking me how to get some high level questions to practice. Now, there is no easy answer for this because high level questions are not that common. So uh, one of the best sources is your mock tests. So mock test, of course, uh, it is not something that you can uh, give like every day and you cannot always get the questions like whatever questions you want. So what you can do is uh, go to Google and just write down high level DI or like high level average questions or high level simplification, something like this. So if you just write it down, you will find many, many free PDFs online. You do not even have to pay anything for these PDFs and those PDFs you can just download and you can keep with you. Now, what happens is if you take it from different sources, then you can get different types of high level questions. And believe me, this is something that I used quite a lot during my preparation phase. I uh, picked out those random questions and I found so many different varied questions. So if you do it from different providers, this actually really helps you out. So you'll find lots of free PDFs. And even in my own Telegram channel, I have uploaded many free PDFs. So please uh, go and take a look. Uh, man, many of these uh, things are going to be very, very beneficial for you. So it's uh, going to be totally invaluable. And uh, also make sure that you are doing some time bound practice. Now, many people, they just uh, sit down for practice and they do not have the clock. They do not have a watch, a stopwatch or anything, but don't make that mistake. You always have to have a timer. So you can even do it on Google. Just go to Google, write down timer. You will find that a Google timer appears and uh, you can just go ahead and set a timer and you can solve the question. So I always used to time myself. So I would say that maybe 10 questions I have to do in 30 minutes. So this is how I started. And then I would just reduce the time. So then 10, 10 questions in 20 minutes and then 15 minutes. So like this, if you are challenging yourself, if you are timing yourself, then it actually helps you quite a lot because in the final examination, there is always a timer that is running out, right? And it is not something that you can ignore. So this type of a practice strategy, it actually helps you to acclimatize with that final examination uh, structure that you are going to face in the e actual examination hall. So do it. Always have time bound practice. Never practice practice without having a stopwatch, without having a timer. So that's very important. And uh, finally, a bonus tip for you, uh, keep your ego aside. Now, many people I have seen, they would go into a question and uh, then they would find that it is quite hard, but they cannot leave that question. They feel that, okay, I have uh, got to solve this because this is a matter of my pride. And uh, if I cannot solve this, then how can I become a PO? Because uh, I have to be quite good in maths. Otherwise, I cannot become a PO. This is a very wrong notion. Remember, I have told this on this channel multiple times. Many, many SBI POs are working in SBI right now who have scored zero marks in quant. Yes, zero marks they have scored and still they have become SBI POs. So remember this thing. It is not about becoming a genius. It is not about understanding everything. You just have to pass this examination. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be some kind of a brilliant student. It is all about passing an exam. So don't take it to heart that I can't solve this question, that I have to fight with this question. Move on. This entire thing is about strategy. The person with the best strategy will become a PO and the person who does not strategize and who is just going ahead and doing hard work but not smart work is not going to win. So remember, hard work is definitely important but smart work is even more important. With that, I hope that you learned something from this video and that it was beneficial to you. If you enjoyed it, please click on the like button and share it with your friends. And if you want to see more of this kind of content, please click on the subscribe button and do not forget to click the bell icon so that you, my friend, do not miss any future update. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.